Wow, what a spectacular view of the Sea of Galilee. From right here, I can see the entire body of water. Up there to the north is Capernaum. Over to the west is Tiberias. And to the south, the Jordan River starts again. This eastern side is the beginning of the Golan Heights. Prior to the Six-Day War of 1967, this was part of Syria, but now it's part of Israel. It's a vast plateau extending hundreds of miles. Before the war, it was nothing but desert, but through irrigation, the Israelis have transformed their portion of the Golan Heights into beautiful and productive farmland. The area on this side of the sea was Gentile when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. Just as it was before the Six-Day War, it was not part of Israel. The story tells us that the prodigal son went to a far country, which possibly meant that he came right here. It wasn't that he was far away from his father geographically as much as he was spiritually. The story also tells us that the son ended up feeding pigs, which is intriguing because wild boars still roam the land here. When I think about the story of the prodigal son, I often wonder if I would have the courage to return home. All too often, I find myself struggling with God's acceptance and His grace. In some ways, I think that we can all relate to the story of the prodigal. Because it's not just our story, it's the story of our God who loves us so much. As I sit here, I can almost imagine the father of the prodigal standing on an opposite shore, hoping, praying, and waiting for his son's return. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Step after step, canyon after canyon, hill after hill, mile after mile, the son was returning to his father, the one who had raised him, who had taught him right for wrong, who had taught him the law of Moses, and now he was returning home, probably barefoot, walking across hilly terrain like this, very similar. 
in Israel. No money, no food, thirsty, sleeping in dangerous places like caves. Probably spent a lot of time in canyons just like this one. Lonely, afraid, the wild animals. Long, cold nights under the stars with bugs crawling all over him. Survivor man has nothing on the prodigal son. And what about the emotions as he walked along? What have I done? Well, what will my dad do? Will he even let me return as a servant? And the townspeople, what will they do? All of these questions would have been racing through the mind of the prodigal son as he returned home. But I'm a father, and if my son would have gone off and spent my money and then returned to me, I would have accepted him back without even hesitating. So what's the big deal about this parable of the prodigal son? And has the father really done something special? Well, if we think that he hasn't done something special, it's because we're reading from the 21st century viewpoint. And we need to read this parable of the prodigal son from the first century. We need to change our glasses and put on first century glasses and read this as a Jewish person of the first century would do. So that's what we'll try to do as we take a deeper look at the parable of the prodigal son. Well, the context of the parable is found in the verse, two verses of Luke 15. It says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. In the Roman Empire in the first century, they collected taxes by using tax farmers. Basically, someone would go to the Roman Empire, to the, whoever's in charge, and say, Hey, I want to be a tax farmer and I'll pay you this much money in order to collect taxes in this area. And then they would contract how much money that tax farmer had to pay the government. And then they could go charge whatever they wanted. So let's take an example. Let's pretend that you are the tax farmer in your town. And you contract with the government to pay, let's say, a million dollars in taxes. So you go out all around the town and you collect taxes. But you don't collect a million dollars. You collect as much as you can. Let's say you can collect two million dollars. You pay the government their million and you get a million right in your pocket. Let's say that you're really good and you can collect $3 million, million to the government, $2 million for you. Well, imagine what the town would think of you as their tax farmer. They wouldn't like you very much. And that's what we have in the first century. The tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. But not only that, Jesus ate with them. Jesus is eating with tax collectors and with sinners. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal to us in the 21st century because we go to restaurants and we eat with whoever. I mean, we don't even go to the table next to us and check to see if they're clean or unclean, if they're a sinner or not a sinner. We just eat and we don't worry about it. But in the first century, they worried about it. See, they had all of these laws on clean and unclean. And clean people, like the Pharisees, didn't eat with people who were unclean, like tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus was eating with sinners. This was not good, according to the Pharisees. In response to these questions from the Pharisees and Jewish leaders, Jesus tells some parables, and one of them is the parable of the prodigal son. Verse 12 says that this son asked his father for his inheritance. Now, you don't get your inheritance until your dad dies. I mean, imagine going up to your father and saying, uh, Dad, I... I wish that I could have all the money that's going to be due to me when you die. But he's not dead, he's still alive. In other words, this son is wishing that his dad were dead right now so that he could have the money. Now, the father should have done what any good father would do and discipline his son and tell him, no, you cannot have the money and send him to his room and give him a time out or something even worse than that. But this father doesn't do that. This father says, okay and he gives him his money. Now, according to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, the younger son would receive one-third of whatever the father was worth. Well, how does the father get that money? I mean, he doesn't have a, an IRA pension fund or stocks and bonds that he can go sell. His money is found in his animals, in his property. So how does he get the money to give to his younger son? He sells it. He holds a yard sale, an estate sale. And everybody comes up and says, why are you selling your stuff? And this father has to experience the shame of telling them 
that his younger son wants the inheritance now. His younger son wishes that he were dead, but the father gives it to him. And the next verse in the text says that the son took the money and he went off. He went off to distant lands. Now, it doesn't say where he went, but most likely distant lands means that he left Israel and went into Gentile lands. And this is going to be really important, as we'll see in just a minute. The text goes on to say that the son squandered his wealth in this distant land on wild living. Now, it doesn't tell us what wild living is, but we can make a guess based on what culture was like back then. You see, this son went to a place where he didn't know anyone. So most likely he was spending his money in order to entertain people and bribe them so that he could befriend other people, probably throwing big parties, eating good food. And if he was doing this in the, the Greco-Roman culture of the first century, if he was throwing big parties, this also meant that there would be prostitutes there because that was very common. So when the son squandered his wealth on wild living, we know what he did. It's kind of like today. If your son went off and he went to Las Vegas and experienced all that Las Vegas has to offer, all the sin and the women and the booze, everything that he could, that's what this son has done in the first century culture. Verse 14 says that the son went and spent everything that he had and that no one would give him anything. He couldn't beg because in first century Greco-Roman culture, they wouldn't give any money to beggars. So this guy was in trouble. So what's he do? Well, he goes to a, a farm and he feeds pigs. Now, pigs for a Jewish person are unclean. The Old Testament law forbids a Jewish person from eating pork. So this Jewish young man is feeding pigs, which are unclean. And not only that, but the next verse says that he longs to eat what they're eating. Now, that word long can also be translated as he desires it. He craves it. He even lusts after what the pigs are eating. Now, I grew up in the Midwest. I know pig farms. I have a, a friend, Greg, who's a pig farmer. And I asked him one time if he's ever eaten what the pigs eat. And he smiled and said, yeah, yeah, I have. And I said, how was it? And he said, it was awful. I would never want to eat it again. This young man lusts after what the pigs are eating. And the next verse says that in this dire circumstance of feeding unclean animals and wishing he could eat what they're eating, he comes to his senses. And in the context of Luke chapter 15, I think what that means is that the son repents of his sins. He figures out that he's done something wrong. He shouldn't have done what he did. Everything that he's done for the past, however long it was, he realizes that he has sinned. So he comes up with a plan. Go back home. <laughs> what else can he do? But he also knows that he can't go back and be a son again. So he comes up with a plan to go back and just be a slave, a hired servant. Maybe, just maybe, my dad will make me a slave and I can work and pay back my dad all the money that I had taken and then gone and wasted. He has no idea of becoming a son again. That's impossible. He's burnt that bridge. He can't become a son again. He's wished that his dad were dead. So he returns home, walking, and this is how we were starting this whole study, going through canyons, wondering, what will happen when I get home? What will my dad, will my dad even accept me back? He has no idea what's going to happen to him next when he returns home. While the son is still a long ways away, his father sees him and has compassion now, the word compassion is very interesting because in the Gospels, it's only used of God and of Jesus. People are never referred to as compassionate in the Gospels. Only God and only Jesus are compassionate. And the compassionate God, the text says, uh, the compassionate Father runs towards the Son. He runs. Now, that makes sense to us. When my son was three years old, he decided that he had had enough of Dad one day. He was three and he was going to go it on his own. He could handle it. He was three years old. So he opens up the garage door, walks out the driveway, turns right down the sidewalk and starts walking down the sidewalk. Well, by the time he got to the third house, I realized that my three-year-old son was not going to return. So I ran to my son. 
I ran as fast as I could to get to him, and then I grabbed him. That makes sense to us if the father runs. But in the first century, with our first century glasses, it makes no sense that the father runs. Because back then, a father, a Jewish father, would never run. Because in order to run, they would have to take their tunic and tie it up onto their belt in order that their legs wouldn't trip when they run. And when they pulled up their tunic, they would show their legs. And if you showed your bare legs in that culture, it was shameful. It was disgraceful. So a father would never run. So the question is, why did the father run? And this is where the Jewish context really comes into play. You see, if the son runs away with dad's money and spends it in Gentile lands and then comes home, the community does something. The community will take a jar and when the son returns, will take the jar and smash it on the ground into a million pieces and they will announce, so-and-so is cut off from their people and they can never return. So that's what the son should expect when he returns home. The community will break a pot and reject him forever. So the, the father, the compassionate father, sees the son coming and he runs. Why does he run? Well, text doesn't say, but it seems to me that he runs in order to get to the son before the community gets to him. In other words, the, son, the father pulls up his tunic, shows his bare legs, takes shame upon himself because he wants to get to the son before the community gets there and rejects him. So the father takes the shame that the son would have taken. And the father runs out, probably to the edge of the village, and he gets to his son. And what's he do? He hugs him. He kisses him. And the Greek word here is he kisses him again and again, not just a little peck on the cheek, but the father just can't get enough of this. Now, at this point, I, I just wonder what in the world is going through the son's mind? As he was walking home, there was no way that he could have, could have imagined that. Verse 21 says that the son begins to give his speech that he had prearranged, his repentant speech. Now, this is important to remember that the son has repented. You see, people get confused here a lot. They say, well, the father accepts anyone back. And then they say that God accepts anyone back. And, and that's true, but there's also repentance here. This isn't just that God accepts everybody no matter what they do, no matter how they act. This son has repented and the father accepts him back. The Gospels are very clear that the father will accept anyone back who repents and who confesses their sins. But it's a different story if people don't repent of their sins. The Gospels say then the father doesn't accept them back, but they can only expect judgment. But if they repent, the father will run to them. Verse 22 then says that the father says, quick, bring my best robe and put it on him. This is probably the father's special robe that he drapes over his son's shoulders to show everybody in the village, this is my boy and I've accepted him back. He then puts a ring on his finger. This is probably the family signet ring, the ring that you could melt wax and make your impression showing that it's the family's. It's probably similar today when your son or daughter grows up and you finally trust them enough to give them the credit card and they can go charge something in your name. That's what the son gets. He gets his dad's credit card, the signet ring. And then the father says, put some shoes on my boy. You see, slaves would go barefoot, but sons always wore shoes. Verse 23 then says that the father has one more plan. He says, get the fatted calf. Get it ready, we're gonna have a big party. Now, you don't get a fatted calf for a father and two sons. You get the fatted calf when you're gonna have a whole celebration for the whole village. In other words, the father is inviting everybody, the whole village to celebrate with him because his son, who was lost, is now found. His son, who is dead, is now alive. And he wants to celebrate that fact. I absolutely love the story of the prodigal son. 
I mean, if, if I could only have one chapter of the Bible, it would probably be this one because it tells us so much about the Father. And it's, you have to know the first century culture to really understand that parable, but that first century culture and the applications that they had totally come into the 21st century. And that's what we want to look at now, the applications. The first one is very, very simple. The Father forgives us. He restores us. He takes us back. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've gone. It doesn't matter how many times we've done it. The Father will forgive us as long as we, like the son in the story, as long as we return to the Father and repent of our sins. It's absolutely wonderful what the Father does for us. The son couldn't have done it. The son couldn't go back and say, I demand to be a son again. Just like we, we're not good enough. We're not righteous enough to demand anything from God the Father. It's God the Father who will come to us. All we have to do is begin to turn in repentance and the Father will run our way and accept us back. It's wonderful news. Forgiveness is a beautiful thing. It not only has spiritual benefits, but psychologists has, have recently begun to study the physiological, the physical benefits of forgiveness as well. They're finding that forgiveness literally lowers your blood pressure. It increases the health of your heart. It reduces bad things like anger and stress and fear. It seems that God has hardwired us physically so that forgiveness is of benefit to us, not just when we are forgiven, but also when we forgive other people too. We experience those same, not only spiritual benefits, but physical benefits as well. So that's the first application, the Father forgives us. And the second one is very similar. The Father takes away our shame. You know, when that Father pulled up his tunic and tucked it into his belt and ran to his son, he took the shame upon himself that the son should have received when he came back into the community, the community that he had rejected. In the same way, the father takes our shame away.